Take a look at these 24 karat gold coated seat belts on a 757. The gilded fixtures, if that's not a giveaway, you're looking at Trump Force One, which is what some were calling Trump's personal plane. What's interesting is the gilded accents aren't unique to that plane. Trump's failed airline, Trump Shuttle, had gold-plated hardware, which was just one of uh, several stylistic decisions that made no sense. The planes had marble sinks that were too heavy for the aircraft, so Trump Shuttle had to opt for faux marble. The former president doesn't have the best track record, objectively speaking, when it comes to these types of plane calls. And we got further evidence of that today because when Trump was in office, he wanted to redesign the replacement for Air Force One a color scheme that was very similar to his personal plane, red, white, and dark blue, taking over the iconic light blue and gold design. Well, today, amidst other admittedly more important things, the Biden administration is scrapping the paint scheme officially, saying no to Donald Trump's decoration skills and keeping the classic design that has worked since JFK was president, which is much of the plane era. An official saying the paint scheme is not consider being considered because it could drive additional engineering time and cost. The darker blue would have made the inside of the plane too hot and then required other modifications to cool the plane's parts. That is what we call a rough landing. Donald Trump was at the center of this conspiracy and ultimately Donald Trump, the president of the United States, spurred a mob of domestic enemies of the Constitution to march down the Capitol and subvert American democracy. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. The first primetime January 6th hearing laying the foundation for a specific case against Trump. Now, foundation is something you build on. The committee is trying to do that Monday with the second hearing, bearing down on how exactly Trump knew that he actually lost. Then there'll be evidence going inside the DOJ about what would have been the mother of all Saturday night massacres as Trump tried to oust the acting AG, for resisting efforts to have the DOJ help with the coup. Three former officials will testify. On Thursday, the committee will focus on Trump's efforts to pressure Pence. We all remember that. And later hearings will feature evidence on Trump's efforts to overturn the whole election through state level means. Representative Kinzinger, the other Republican member besides Cheney, says the evidence together at these hearings will change history. The Watergate hearings were famously about what Nixon knew and when he knew it. These hearings are going from what Trump knew to what he tried to get government officials to do from the DOJ to Congress to state election officials and state legislators, a kind of dizzying spread of targets for what was an increasingly desperate effort to stay in office. Now, most of those officials balked or outright resisted because coups are, among other things, a team sport. Donald Trump, never very good at teamwork. And that may be why, as mentioned, the committee has so many witnesses, including Trump aides and plenty of Republicans, who are out here testifying in detail under oath to his illicit goals and demands. Joining us now is Professor Melissa Murray from New York Law School, co-host of the Strict Scrutiny podcast. And as an educator, we believe somewhat more skilled at teamwork. Um, thanks for joining us on a Friday night. Thanks for having me, Ari. Um, we just laid out where the committee is headed, uh, including some of the theory of the case. So walk us through your thoughts on that. So I think the big thing here is they are very much trying to show that not only was Donald Trump at the center of all of these machinations, this wasn't inadvertent or coincidental. This was something that he wanted to be at the center at. Indeed, it was something that he was orchestrating or directing others to orchestrate on his behalf. So this really goes to the question of mental state. And that's critical if there's going to be criminal liability going forward. And of course, the committee can't determine whether or not there is a prosecution against Donald Trump. That's only for the Department of Justice to determine. But if the Department of Justice is going to go forward, it has to be secure in the knowledge that there is evidence to support the idea that not only did Donald Trump do certain things or fail to do certain things that he was supposed to do, but that he had the mental state to orchestrate this kind of coup against a lawful government. And so this is all incredibly critical. And even if there is no criminal prosecution, 
all of this evidence regarding his mental state and what he knew and at what time could be critically important if there's going to be civil lawsuits against Trump and anyone in that inner circle, the kinds of civil lawsuits that we saw successfully prosecuted in Charlottesville, Virginia, for example, against the organizers of Unite the Right. I'm also curious what you thought of the way they presented this last night, which appears to be a template. Um, Rachel and I discussed this a little bit last night because everyone is accustomed to the traditional hearings. First of all, when they're not select committees, you have the partisan back and forth. Uh, second of all, everyone gets their time. And this format is really putting one to two members of the committee in the lead, a limited number of witnesses live, and then really drawing on the evidentiary cream, if you will, if you want to be a huge nerd with me, the cream of hundreds of depositions and not making the public sit through that, which again is different from traditional hearings. So I'm curious as someone who, who really is versed in the presentation of the law, what you thought about that last night, because it's so different than most hearings. Well, Ari, I'm wearing a dress that's literally covered with books. So obviously I'm happy to nerd out with you. On and you this, have a lot of books behind just, you. I like big books and I cannot lie. Um, this is <laughs> obviously lot, incredibly <laughs> good shout out. This is obviously highly choreographed and by design. And you know, this was very similar to what they did for the second impeachment, where there were a lot of multimedia presentations designed to sort of link all of this together. Here, though, they're actually, I think it, it's necessary to have this kind of highly choreographed presentation rather than the back and forth that we're used to, because they need to tell a story that brings together some really disparate pieces of this puzzle and shows how they're all inextricably intertwined and linked together. And so, you know, you know, again, this the usual sort of partisan back and forth. Um, it's not really the case here because there are only two Republicans on this committee, so there isn't the necessary back and forth. But it goes with a kind of interrupted flow. Here, they have an uninterrupted moment to present their case, to present it the way that they want to present it without any rebuttal in between. And they can actually lay the case out for the American people, show how all of these different disparate pieces of evidence link together and do so in a way that's compelling for a generation that, frankly, is not the kind of generation that we saw in Watergate that's sort of used to sitting in front of the TV for hours watching these sorts of things. This is a social media audience that wants to see fast paced taste clickbaity, like interesting and very dynamic clips all put together and they're doing that. So they've gotten a lot of blowback for having it be produced, but I don't really know that they had any other option. Yeah. And I would say that that blowback is only on the internal sort of Eastern seaboard uh, obsessive discussion range. I don't think most of the 19 million Americans watching it live were like, oh, when I read in Axios who the committee hired, I think they're going to really just say, was this a clear story or not? And as, if we, as we've emphasized, um, if it's done right, that's so people can have the facts. What they decide about that should be up to them in a democracy. So um, I've got Beschloss on standby, so I'm going to let you go into your weekend. Professor Murray, good to see you as always. Thank you. in 1862, when American citizens had taken up arms against this country, Congress adopted a new oath to help make sure no person who had supported the rebellion could hold a position of public trust. Therefore, Congresspersons and United States federal government employees were required for the first time to swear an oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That oath was put to test on January 6, 2021. Foreign and domestic. From the Constitution's founding to the oath history we heard there, there has always been an awareness that democracy and safety can come in peril by our own fellow Americans. Chairman Thompson was referencing that last night. It may have went right by some people because a lot happened, but it was quite a striking moment and a historically accurate one. The oath that many view as a kind of symbolic gesture that people do when they become members of Congress, we're showing you many of those from recent times, is actually a version of the ironclad oath that was used after the Civil War. And there was nothing symbolic about it. It was actually a kind of litmus test at the time. Southern rebels could not truthfully swear to that oath had they attacked 
the country and they could be barred from office or voting or charged with perjury if they were someone who did do those things and were trying to sneak through the loophole of the oath by claiming otherwise. Now, many people don't think practically about that oath or the president's oath to defend the country from enemies foreign and domestic. Never in our over 200 year history have people, even with the great and deep differences in our nation, had to wonder whether the president would become an enemy, whether the president would observe, for example, an armed attack on the seat of government, be it from foreign terrorists or domestic, as I'm emphasized here tonight, and that that president would do nothing because some enemies would not be enemies to the eyes of that president. As the chairman said there, January 6th tested all of this. And the question is, what do we do with history as a roadmap here, given that we have been tested before, we have had armed rebellion before? And how did the story of these hearings continue to confer some historical weight as they go on through the next weeks? For that conversation, we have a little bit of the past and a little bit of the present. Michael Beschloss is NBC News presidential historian. No better guest to talk about that history of rebellion. And here in the present, we have a former Obama advisor, political strategist, Che Komen Dury, about the rhetorical and communication challenges of holding the nation's attention in the coming hearings. Uh, Michael, I'll begin with you and your thoughts on that little bit of history the chairman shared and how it applies. I'm so glad he mentioned it, and I'm so glad you mentioned it, Ari, because here's a case where what people were saying at the end of the Civil War, people from the North, the victorious side, said, you know, we've won the Civil War, but we're in danger, you know, because without an oath like this that will keep these people out of positions of public trust, who's to say that old Confederate senators will not run for the Senate again and get elected, and they, they will use their purchase in the Senate to try to have another civil war and another offense against the federal government, just as happened in Fort Sumter uh, with the firing on Fort Sumter in 1861. And they were absolutely right, because as you both know, there was a Confederate president whose name was Jefferson Davis. Davis was a former senator from Mississippi. And Davis, uh, after 1865, took him a couple of years, but he began giving speeches. And what did Davis say? Davis said, the South never lost the Civil War. Mm. Actually, we won, but it was stolen from us. Mm. And we've got to do something to get that back. Who does that remind you of? Powerful uh, and well put. And, and Che, we wanted to bring you into this segment because you've been very thoughtful about how do you do effective communication or governing within these extreme environments? And one of the challenges of standing up to extremism is that you can start to look extreme. Uh, in the dawn of the Trump era, um, some people who were genuinely concerned and issuing warnings were written off as histrionic. Um, people can judge for themselves whether the warnings bore, were you know, borne out. Uh, Trump left the way he left office, and we see that. What do you see as the challenge for Democrats, and how are they navigating it in trying to wake everyone up in these hearings without having it sound like every hearing is, oh, my God, a five-alarm fire in a way that reduces the significance? How do you navigate that? Yeah, I think, quite frankly, the Democrats have, have nailed it. I think it's been a perfect 10 in terms of the execution of this hearing. I think that the way they have packaged this, the way they have sort of really tried to tell a story, a specific story about what happened. Donald Trump said X, Y happened. That is the way this hearing is proceeding. And I think that's crucial going forward in terms of telling the story of this hearing. I do think the challenge actually will not be for Democrats the hearing. I think this challenge will be what comes after the hearing. And there, I think history gives us two very different examples. So I'll bring up Watergate, where, you know, the hearings concluded, uh, uh, articles of impeachment were adopted. Uh, there was a definite follow through. There were definite action items. Barry Goldwater went to the White House. The rest was history. The other one I bring up is Iran-Contra. And Iran-Contra was a situation where Democrats had the hearings. There were no action items. There was really no follow up. There was no real argument that Ronald Reagan and the Reagan administration needs to be held accountable. Oliver North kind of swept in and made an appeal to conservative tribalism, which is exactly what Tucker Carlson is doing now. And the result was the hearings had no impact. A year later, 
voters went to the polls, didn't even think about the Iran-Contra scandal when they re re-elected the Reagan administration to effectively stay in power. Those action items, that follow-up, what follows these hearings, I would argue, is going to be more crucial towards the outcome of how this would be remembered than the hearings themselves. I think the hearings themselves have been tremendous. Great moments. Liz Cheney was tremendous. That is a world historical moment, I think, that she had last night. I think Ivanka Trump, that was a, one of the most talked about moments really today on social media, was what she said about her father and then what her father today said about her. But I think it's what comes after the hearings where the challenges lie. Hmm. Yeah, all fair points. Michael? Well, this was a plot against democracy. It's, it, I thought it was evident on the day it happened. I was just looking back. I did a tweet at 2.47 p.m. during this attack saying, this is a coup d'etat by the president of the United States. It's not that I was so prescient. It was because you began to see who could benefit and what Trump said about people marching to the Capitol. So this was sort of hiding in plain sight. But the point is that this was done by a president who was happy to dismantle our system. And he was doing it, we're increasingly finding, arm in arm with people who can be fairly described as domestic terrorists. Some of the groups that you were talking about earlier this, uh, uh, earlier this hour. And, you know, more than that, if it had succeeded, you know, let's just think about that for a moment. 6th of January, historically, we might not have this program to be saying what we think on the air right now. You know, what would be the role of the military be in the society? Would there be martial law? Would there be an uh, invocation of the Insurrection Act? Would there have been a move by President Donald Trump, who was holding on to a second term that he didn't deserve, to jail his enemies? We don't know any of that, but that's what's at stake. And unless we identify those guilty, punish those guilty, and as Shea was saying, pass reform laws to make sure it never happens again, all of us in this country will live under a sword of Damocles. Hmm. All important points, uh, Michael Beschloss and Shea Komandori. I want to thank you both. Uh, I hope people are listening.